What a Savior that we all have. Amen. I love the old song, It Is Well With My Soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. Is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, all my soul. Amen. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. Amen. When you think that we have peace, I thought the rapture was happening for a second. Good. But when I when I think that I was dead in sin, and I had no hope, and I was without God in the world, and that Jesus Christ died to reconcile me back to God, to give me eternal life, and I now have hope. At one time I had no hope, but now I have hope in Jesus Christ. My dad died two years ago. My dad was a preacher. Died two years ago. When he died, I just said, Dad, go on behind the veil. I'll be there shortly. Amen. Amen. I've got hope of seeing my father again. You know, when I leave here, when I leave here, I may never see any of you again. But I'll see you in the air one day. Amen. And I just thank God for what we have. Amen. Brother Bobby talking about street preaching. Amen, brother. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ needs soldiers, man. He don't need a, he don't need a bunch of cowards. He needs soldiers. Amen. Paul, hey, there you go. <laughs> Paul said, Paul said, war and good warfare. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. We wrestle not against, you see how Paul talks about the ministry? Fighting, warring, wrestling, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know why a lot of people don't like street preaching? Because they're worried about their image. But it ain't about your image anymore. Your image was nailed to the cross. It's about bearing the image of the Lord Jesus Christ now. And you can't be ashamed of His image. Amen? Alright, Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to try. I might be a little boring this morning, guys. I might get a little boring. I'm going to be a, a little... We're going to do a little more teaching this morning. We're going to try to take you through the Bible, the timeline of the Bible. I, there's no way I can teach you the whole Bible. But what I want to try to do is to give you an overview of the Bible so that you know how to study it better for yourself. I've been studying the Bible for over 20 years now. There's times I've read and studied this book for 20 straight hours. There's times that I've cried over this book and my tears have hit the pages of that book and said, God, I want to know your truth. I don't understand this. I have stared at passages for hours at a time before. People say, how would you learn your Bible? I learned my Bible by sticking my nose in the Bible. Amen? And I've studied it. I've read it. I know Brother Bobby has. And it ain't hard to tell the difference between a man who was sent by a seminary and a man who actually has that book written in their heart. Amen? In Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's why we're all here. Forget Darwin. Forget evolution and atheism and everything else. The invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. 
Everything that we see testifies to the power of God. Amen. Everything is, everything is today because in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Amen? Yes, God created two realms, heaven and earth, and he has a plan for his creation. Amen? Part of the plan was spoken, part of it was kept secret. If you understand that, you're off to a good start. Amen? Part of God's plan was kept secret since the beginning. Part of it was spoken. This part here was spoken concerns his plan for the earth. This part that was kept secret concerns his plan for the heaven. Amen? One of these days, Satan and his angels are going to be cast out of the heaven. And I'm going to stick my tongue out, out at them when they go by. Amen? I can't wait for the day that de the devil and his angels are cast out of the heavenly places. When that day comes, you know what they say in heaven? Now is salvation. Now is the kingdom of our Lord. Now is the kingdom of our Savior. Amen. Rejoice ye that dwell in heaven for the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Amen. Now when God created these two realms, as you're reading in the, as you're reading the Old Testament, just remember that the whole time you're reading the Old Testament, there's something being hidden in God. There's a secret being kept by God. Amen? But he begins to reveal his plan for the earth. And what he, what he begins to tell us is that he made a man down here on the earth. Genesis 1.26, if y'all want to flip there, we'll read it. Genesis 1.26. God said, let us make man in our what? And after our... So you know what Adam, why Adam was created? He was created to be the image and likeness of God in the earth. He was created to be the image of the invisible God. That's what godliness is. Godliness is God-likeness. When Paul said, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. What is godliness? Godliness is God manifest in the flesh. And there's only one way God can be manifest in the flesh, and it's through the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. But man was created to be God's image in the earth. Amen. The image of the invisible God. Adam. You know what the Bible calls him in Luke? The son of God. Adam was God's son. Created to be in God's image. And then he tells him there in verse 20, 26. Keep reading there. Not only was he in God's image and likeness. But God said, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. God had just made the sea on the third day, didn't he? Yep. Yeah. Then he says, let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the beasts of the field and over cattle and over the fowl of the heaven and over the, every creeping thing. So God creates this man and then gives him dominion over what God had created. Man. Adam is a king. That man was created to be a king in the earth. To have dominion over God's works and over God's creation. To be God's image in the earth. Verse 28, he gives Adam some things to do now. As this man, Genesis 1, 28, God blessed them. And said, be fruitful and multiply. And replenish the earth and subdue it. What was Adam's job? To fill this earth up with 
this image that God had given him. Adam's in God's image. God wants him to reproduce that image and to fill the earth up and to subdue it to God. Amen? Y'all understand? That dominion right there, that creation, the earth, was given to this man right here, and his purpose was to fill it up and subdue it to God. While well, I look around, something went wrong. Because the majority of men that fill this earth do not know our God. They're not, this earth is not subdued to God. This earth is in rebellion against God. Something happened. Something went wrong. Amen? Amen. Look at Genesis chapter 3. God gave that man one commandment. God gave that man free eternal life. Eternal life was free to that man right there as long as he didn't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He had one commandment. Don't eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Amen? Amen. Genesis chapter 3. Y'all better, y'all better, y'all better pay close attention to what I'm about to tell you. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field or any creature that God had made. The devil's real. And you're no match for him. There's only been one man in this world that said the prince of this world cometh and he hath nothing in me. There was only one man in this world that the devil could not get. And it was the Lord Jesus Christ. But you, without this book, and without God, and without the armor of God, are no match for the serpent. He's more subtle than any creature God ever made. If he wants to deceive you, he knows how to do it. And the only protection you have is the truth of this book. Because look at what Satan, you know what Satan wants? We've already looked at it. Satan wants to be the possessor of heaven and earth. Amen? So if Adam was created to subdue the earth to God, the only way Satan can take control of the earth is to get Adam to disobey God. But the only way he can get Adam to disobey God is to question the authority of what God said. The whole issue in heaven and earth is not religion, not Catholicism. The whole issue in heaven and earth is what God said. Look at what he says, Matthew 3, 1. Or, I'm sorry guys, y'all turn to Matthew 3, it's actually a good place to go to, you know. But in Genesis chapter 3, he says, Yea, hath God said. Satan is always going, now listen, Satan appears as an angel of light. His ministers transform themselves into the ministers of righteousness. But you know you're dealing with a devil when the first thing he does is question what God said. Amen. You don't believe it? God said something in Genesis. Satan showed up and said, Hath God said? In Matthew chapter 3, the next man, Jesus Christ, there's the first man, Adam. God said something to him. Satan come and questioned what God said. And before you know it, man believed the lie. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Right. Yeah. The second man, Jesus Christ, came. Right. And at the baptism, God spoke and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Very next chapter, Satan shows up and says, If thou be the Son of God. 
You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to get man out from under the authority of what God said. You have to have an authority. Without an authority, men is lawless. Without an authority, heaven and earth is in iniquity. God gave us his word, and it's the only authority that we should have. But because this first man disobeyed God, he fell. And the whole world fell into sin, and the whole world now lieth in wickedness. That's 1 John. Amen? You know who controls the kingdom of the, uh, the kingdoms of these of this world now? It ain't God. Because the world is not subject to God. The world is now under this serpent now who has usurped power and authority of heaven and earth. That's the world you live in. Amen. Now this period here, from the fall to the flood, is what the Bible calls the old world. Amen. That's in First Second Peter chapter two verse five. And talking about God, it says that He spared not the old world, but saved Noah. You know what Genesis chapter 5 says? The book of the generations of Adam. And you know what happened to the generations of Adam? God killed them all. They become so corrupt, so vile, so violent, that God repented that he had even put man upon the earth. And he wiped out the entire generations of Adam and saved Noah and his three sons, three daughters, and their wives. Eight people were saved from the old world. And then he brought in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Amen? Amen. It's what we call the old world. This old world perished at the flood. Amen? Amen. Now that image that God created Adam in, look at Genesis chapter 5. I think I got it up here. God made man in his own image. But when Adam disobeyed God, Adam lost that image of God. Adam was no longer in God's image. Genesis chapter 5 says, Adam lived 130 years. And begat a son in his own likeness. This is why Christ is yeah, called yeah. the only begotten Son of God. Yeah. Only Christ is in the image of God. Amen. Because Adam begat a son in his own likeness. Amen. After his image and called his name Seth. Adam has the image of a sinner. Adam is no longer in the image of God. Adam's no longer godly. He's not in. It's called the world of the ungodly. Godliness didn't exist in Adam's world. By one man, sin entered into the world. And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Right there. You see, the world, the earth that God gave Adam, he was, he was supposed to subdue it to God. But that world is under subjection to sin, not God. Paul, Paul in Romans chapter 7, he says, he says, he says, I will to do what's good, but how to perform it I find not. 
He said, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me in the captivity to the law of sin. A man that serves the law of sin cannot be serving the law of God. A man in bondage to sin is not a servant of God. But thanks be unto God that you were the servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you and being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Thanks be to the second man, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Adam's disobedience made us all sinners. Christ's obedience made us all righteous. Amen. And so Christ is going to be the one that gets the creation subdued back to God. But right now, it's under this serpent. Amen. You've got to understand that. And so, since the fall of man, Paul says in Ephesians 2, that in time past, ye walked according to the course, watch this now, of this world. Now there's a world to come that'll be in subjection to Jesus Christ. But this world right now is not subject to Christ. Amen? This world right now is according, the course of this world is according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The spirit that works in all men who are not saved is the prince of the power of the air, Satan. Satan governs this world through the children of disobedience. He is the one that Satan has this, this world on a course, guys. You may think the world's just acting randomly or that there's no reasoning behind it, but Satan has a purpose. We know what that purpose is. Satan wants to set his throne in Jerusalem. And he wants to control heaven and earth from the throne that God created for himself. He wants to usurp God's throne and run heaven and earth. That's where he's taken the world. And anybody that's not in line with God's plan is in line with this one. Man, my phone is running too much. All right, is that better? 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 So, so Satan now controls the course of this world. Because of the fall of man. But in Genesis chapter 3, God makes a promise here. This Genesis 3, you know who God said that to? He said it to the devil. He didn't say that to the man. He didn't say it to the woman. He said it to the devil. He says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman... And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head. God promises the devil that I'm going to bring a seed out of that woman that's going to bruise your head. Everything that you, everything that Satan has plotted to do, God says he's going to bring it to nothing by the seed of that woman. Amen? Amen. And this is what the Bible's about. 
that coming seed that God promised. That was going to destroy the works of the devil and reconcile and bring all things back to God the Father. Amen. Amen. That, that conflict between the man and the woman plays out in Revelation chapter 12. Look at Revelation chapter 12. We're going from the beginning to the end now, aren't we? Genesis chapter 3, there's a, God said he was going to put enmity between the serpent and the woman. Revelation chapter 12, there's that conflict. Look at Genesis 12, 1. There appeared a great, what? In, in where? What's the wonder? A woman clothed with the sun, crowned with 12 stars, on and on. Look down in verse 3. Is that where he talks about a great red dragon? Having seven heads. And, and this woman, in Revelation 12, she's, she's travailing with child. She's ready to be delivered of a man-child. Amen? And that dragon is by her, ready to devour the man-child as soon as it's born. It's the conflict that God talked about in Genesis chapter 3. Satan is trying to keep that woman from bringing forth the man-child that's going to bruise his head. But she brings forth that man-child. That man-child's caught up to the throne of God and the dragon's cast down to the earth. That's what the Bible's about. Y'all see what the Bible's about? It's about restoring authority back to God. And He gave us a book to do so. Amen? So God promised there was going to be a seed come out of the woman. So what do y'all think Satan's next plot was? To try to corrupt the seed of the woman. Genesis chapter 6, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all which they chose. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to corrupt the seed line of the woman. So that the man child cannot come. Now people will tell you, oh, those sons of God are the sons of Seth. You Bible corrector. Did it say Seth or did it say God? Is there a difference between men, daughters of men, sons of men, and sons of God? Amen. Before we got saved, we were sons of men. And after we got saved, we become sons of God. Amen. So who are these sons of God? Well, all through your Old Testament, they're angelic beings. That are in heaven. Look at, look at Jude chapter 1 up here. And the angels which kept not their first estate. Where's the estate of the angelic realm? It's in the heavens. But there were some angels which kept not that first estate, but left their own habitation. They left their own dwelling place. And those angels that left their own habitation, God hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Now watch what he says. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. 
What Jude is saying is that these angels are just like the men of Sodom and Gomorrah who went after fornication and strange flesh. Do y'all remember the men of Sodom trying to fornicate with two angels? So what happened? These sons of God back here left their own habitation to come down and to take wives of the daughters of men and try to corrupt the seed line of the woman. Right here they are. You see, everything God does, Satan tries to overcome it. Because he is in rebellion against God. God gave dominion to earth over the man. Satan comes, brings him into sin so that the world will be subject to him and not God. God promises a seed out of a woman. The sons of God come down to try to corrupt that seed from coming. However, there was a man named Noah. And the Bible said these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his what? That means his, his genealogy, his seed line was not corrupt. He was perfect in his generations. And so, listen, we always talk about the ark two by two and how God saved all the animals. The most precious thing that God preserved on the ark was that uncorrupt seed that was going to bring forth the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And so Noah was perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. What does it mean to walk with God? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. By faith, Enoch was translated. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Amen. How did he please God? By faith. Amen. How did Noah walk with God? By faith. God said, Noah, there's a flood coming. And Noah was moved with fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his house. God destroys that old world. And then Noah comes out on the other side with his sons, and they become the heirs of the world. Noah and his sons. Amen. Y'all following this? The new king, the new kings of the earth are Noah and his sons. Amen. Genesis chapter 10. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, Japheth. Every race of people in this world goes back to those three sons. Amen? Shem, Ham, Japheth. My people come from Japheth. That's right. Europeans are Japhetic. You guys come from Shem. The Africans come from Ham. Right? Every race of people. But the Bible says that God hath made of one blood all nations. Not only that, He not only made us of one blood, He reconciled all of us by one blood. But God brought these, these sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, unto them were sons born after the flood. Sons of Noah. Sons of their sons. And these, at the end of Genesis, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the what? After the flood. We're still not talking about heaven. This is all about the earth. And so God divided the earth to these nations. What is a nation? It is a people that come from the same family, that have the same language, and have a land 
to dwell in. That's a nation. you got to understand that. God divided, God took the earth and He divided it into portions for families and nations. This is where the nations come from. They come from Noah's sons after the flood. What happened to those nations? They become corrupt. God gave them up. That's what Romans chapter 1 is about. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish hearts were dark, darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like an incorruptible man. The image of God is a serious matter. And man is not to tamper with God's image in his imagination. Amen? So what did God do with the sons of Noah? He gave them up. He gave them over. They did not want God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind and said, Go do what you want to do. But you're going to face me in judgment one day. Deuteronomy 32. Y'all following this? Yes, sir. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. The nations got an inheritance from God. When He separated the sons of Adam, He set the bounds of the people. So God has set boundaries to the nations. Man has broken those boundaries. I mean, you guys know that. The Spanish came here for 300 years. Colonized this place and, and ruled over it. Then the Japanese came, right? The Japanese bombed our country. But America was founded by a bunch of people who overstepped their bounds. Amen. You know why? You know why nations war against each other? Because they're in rebellion against God. God set the boundaries to the nations. And any attempt to break down those boundaries is Satan trying to bring about his global world empire that is under him. Amen. Now look at what he says though. For the Lord's portion is His people. Jacob is the lot of His inheritance. That means Israel is God's inheritance in the earth. He divided the earth to the nations, but He said, My inheritance is Israel. Israel is a very important nation in the earth. God chose them. He chose that bloodline. He chose that seed. And He gave that seed a piece of land in the earth. And God has plans for that land. But He divided the rest of the earth to the nations. But He set apart a piece of land for Him and His people. Well, what about the rest of the nations? Well, he divided them to the heavens. You know what that means? Bobby talked about it yesterday. How many times was the God of Israel in the Old Testament? Y'all remember? How many, how many times has he called the God of Persia? The God of Egypt. In fact, when God goes to Egypt, He said, I've come to execute judgment upon the gods of Egypt. God was only the God of one nation. And He was the God of Israel. The rest of the nations were divided to the sons of God in the heavenly places. Amen? And those gods are corrupt. I'm going to show you the scriptures on this. 
In the heavenly places are thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, and the earth has thrones, dominions, and principalities, and powers. God divided the earth to the sons of Noah, and then he set over those nations principalities and powers in the heavenly places. This is going to make sense when you read your Bible. For example, look, look at Ezekiel 28. I'll, I'll be, what time did I start? Y'all remember? Remember what time I started? to this in America after 20 minutes they're like shut up stop I ain't used to it okay All right. what did I say Ezekiel 28 Ezekiel 28 verse number 2 Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the who? Prince of Tyrus. What does that prince say? I am God. I sit in the seat of God. But what does God say? Thou art a what? So this prince of Tyrus is a man. Where's man's dominion? The earth. So where's that prince at? The earth. Look at Ezekiel 28, I believe it's verse 12. Is that where it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus? You see it? Look down in verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub. So he's talking to a prince. We're talking about the kingdom of Tyrus. Within that kingdom, there was an earthly prince who is a man. But there's also a heavenly king who is a cherub. What I want you to understand, guys, is that every kingdom on this earth is connected to thrones and principalities and powers in heaven. This is why Paul says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. These princes and powers have been over these nations for a long time. Amen. Look at Daniel 10, 13. This is where to, if you understand this, guys, you're going to understand what the body of Christ is for. I know this stuff gets deep. It gets real deep, guys, but it's okay. We got to learn our Bible sometime, don't we? I mean, quit being children under the elements and rudiments of the world. Amen. Amen. Daniel 10, 13. Somebody read that. Real loud. Read it real loud, somebody. Yep. days, right? See, Daniel is down here in the kingdom of Persia, down on the earth. And he's praying. He's been fasting and praying and asking God to show him things. 
And the moment Daniel begins to pray, God sends somebody down here to Daniel. As soon as Daniel begins to pray, Daniel has to pray for 21 days, but God, as the first day that Daniel began to pray, God sent a messenger. But you know what happened? That messenger got held up by a prince of Persia for 21 days in heaven. And Michael, one of the chief princes of the heavenly realm, had to come and help that messenger to get down here to Daniel. Do you know what that means? You know what that messenger was bringing Daniel? When he gets there, he says, I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. You know what that messenger's bringing Daniel? The scriptures. But there are heavenly beings in heaven that withstand the scriptures. And that's who we are in conflict with. Amen. And so when we think about the nations, we are talking about more than just man on the earth. These nations go all the way up to the divisions in the heavenly realm. Amen. Psalm 82. God talks about these beings. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. You know, Satan is called the little G-O-D of this world. You know, the Bible says, when, remember, man was made in the image of God. Satan doesn't tempt man to be like God. He tempts him to be like one of the gods. Knowing good and evil. Amen? This is how Satan usurped authority over the earth. Now here's what God says to these gods. How long will you judge unjustly? These gods over the nations. Remember in Job when it says there was a time when the sons of God came and presented themselves before the Lord and Satan came among them? These gods in the heavenly realm have to come before the throne of God and give an account of how they're running things. This is what we call the mount of the congregation where God standeth in the congregation of the mighty and judges among the gods. And what he asked these gods is, how long do you judge unjustly? And accept the persons of the wicked. Do you know why the wicked prosper in this world? Because these gods reward the wicked. They are unjust judges in the heavenly realm. God tells them to defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. But he says, they know not. Neither will they understand. These gods do not know, nor will they understand. They walk on in darkness. Who did Christ deliver us from? The power. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? And translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Amen. All the 
foundations of the earth are out of course. Why? Because these gods walk in darkness. They will not judge righteously. They reward the wicked. Amen? And so the whole foundations of the earth are out of course. Remember Paul's talked about the course of this world. I have said, this is what God said. He said, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. What is Most High? Possessor of heaven and earth. He said, I have said, all of you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men. God is going to bring death to those gods in the heavenly places one day because of their unrighteous judgment. And they are going to fall like one of the princes. This happens in Revelation 12. Amen. I look forward to it, man. One of these days, Jesus Christ is going to look over at Michael, one of the chief princes of the heavenly realm, and he's going to say, Michael, get your angels and go clean heaven. Go get rid of Satan and his angels and cast them down to the earth. Amen. Arise, O God, and judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Now God's inheritance was Israel. He gave the rest of the nations to these children of the Most High. But because of their corruption and their unjust judgment, He's going to arise and judge the earth and He is going to possess all nations. The God of Israel is going to become the God of all nations of the earth. Amen. What a day that'll be. You know, there's coming a time when all the nations of the earth are going to grow up to Jerusalem. And the God of Israel is going to teach them His ways. And they're going to learn to walk in the ways of God. But you say, okay, so when God gets rid of these children of the Most High in heaven, how is God going to inherit all nations. That's where we come in. God is going to put us. He called you out of the Gentile world. Amen. The seed of Abraham, the seed of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, Paul said he spoiled principality and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. And he ascended up on high, far above all principality and power, and gave gifts unto men. He dispensed to mankind the spoils of his victory as the one who conquered over all of them. And God made Jesus Christ the heir of everything in heaven and earth. And then He called you into His Son to inherit with Him in His heavenly place. That's what Paul calls the high calling of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. It was something Paul was willing to suffer the loss of being a Jew. Paul was a Jew. He had confidence in the flesh. Circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, of the stock of Israel. My righteousness in the law, blameless as touching zeal, persecuting the church. If any man could have confidence in his flesh, it was Paul. But he said, all those things that were gained to me, I suffered loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. And if Paul, an Israelite, a Jew of Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews, 
was willing to suffer the loss of who he was in the flesh to win Christ, how much more should us Gentiles who have nothing suffer the loss of all things to win the Lord Jesus Christ? Because God has called out of this world Jew and Gentile not to be Jew and Gentile, but to become a new man, a new creature that he's creating for this heavenly inheritance that he's going to cast these beings out of one day. Right? We done got to the mystery, and I didn't mean to get to the mystery that quick. But uh, I'm going to stop right here for now. Guys, I hope I can get through this the rest of my time here. After, after when, I, when I preach later, we'll, we'll start to get into Abraham. Because he calls Abraham out of the nations to make of Abraham a great nation in the earth. So the nations come out of Noah, but then he calls Abraham and says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And God's plan in the earth is, is through that great nation of Israel. It's through that nation he's going to bless all nations of the earth. Amen. We'll pick up with that later on.